Welcome everyone to episode six of Clinically Correlate with Asfar and Vedant. I'm so excited to have our guest today, Michael Corbin, one of our co-residents and a dear friend. Um, I will say this is probably one of the most wholesome interviews that we've had. Um, you know, Michael kind of walks us through his journey leading up to pen radiology and, you know, the passion that he exudes of the different parts of his educational journey and ultimately the vision of you know, providing value for patients is so prevalent throughout the entire conversation that most of the time, Asfar and I are just quietly listening and just in awe of what he's saying. Michael, thank you so much for coming, um, and let's get started. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's get started. Um, Michael, we'll uh, ask the question we ask everybody on their first, uh, first time on the podcast. How did you get to where you are, or AKA, tell me about yourself? Oof, the classic. The classic interview question. Very nice. Um, I'm going to give you the way you don't say it on a medical school interview. Okay. I'll tell you the timeline. Okay. Um, so I grew up in Northern Virginia, uh, right outside of D.C., and uh, played sports, loved playing football. And that's going to be key for later on. Nice. Um, anyway, we fast forward into undergrad. And I always knew I wanted to do either law, engineering, or medicine. And so I actually, I went to Virginia Tech for undergrad, and uh, I was going there for patent law. Yes. And I was interested in intellectual property rights, copyright, trademarks. Um, and I knew in order to be good at that, I wanted to have some experience in research, mm -hmm. right? Because if I'm gonna give you the proper intellectual property rights, it's about the verbiage. So how can you explain that in the best way possible if you don't know what it takes to get there? Mm -hmm. So I did research in plant biochemistry. Nice. nice. Of all things. You know, it's funny because my first research was plant pathology. See? Like the tomatoes, the brown spots on the tomato. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Um, we did gene editing. It was amazing. We like shot gold particles into leaves to try to induce viruses uh, to see if we could stop or provide protection against viruses in the future. Anyway, my research PI was telling me, just keep medicine in, in your mind. I was a biochem major, and long story short, it was my third year, right? I was either gonna take the LSAT or the MCAT. Mm. And the last thing I had to do, if I was gonna go into medical school, I was blessed to be in a position to kind of go to either one, mm -hmm. was the clinical experience. I emailed everybody, and one local orthopedic surgeon gave me the opportunity to shadow in his clinic, and I fell in love with it. Yes. And so I said, if I can handle blood, I'm going to do medicine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I applied to medical school, and now I'm here. So. Nice, nice. So that got, got us caught up to you being in medical school. Yeah. How about you doing radiology? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I went to medical school for surgery. That was my first experience. Uh, at the time, it's like, you know, that football mindset carrying forward, rough and tumble, let's do it. Um, first year of med school, got involved with vascular surgery research. And it was an amazing experience. It started out like uh, American Idol. October of first year, you come in and they, are sitting in a panel with all the first year med students on the other side. And they say, this is a best candidate style research program. And you have to come up with an idea and present it to us. And the top three ideas will get funded for summer research. It's October. I don't know anything oh, about medicine, <laughs> let alone vascular surgery, right? Yeah. And so I just kept coming back and people would put up an idea and they say, you know, it won't work for this reason or no one cares about that or we've already done that. Yeah. And it was discouraging for a lot and they would just leave. And I would just come back and come back and shape a project until we had something and I ended up being one of the last three. And I say that because that research was the backbone of radiology for me. I got to spend time in the OR, but I got to look at the images. My focus was on transcarotid artery revascularization. 
And so I'm looking at angiograms, looking at CT, head and neck. It was amazing. And I didn't want to do radiology. I wanted to do vascular surgery. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, who's doing these procedures? So vascular surgeons are doing this procedure. And then I looked at the chart when I'm doing my research and I see interventional radiology. And I'm looking at the op note, vascular surgery, it's this long. And I'm trying to comb through what stint did they use, putting it in my little database. And then IR, it's like a paragraph at max. And I'm like, these guys are smart. Why is it so much shorter? Like, I don't want to have to write this whole long thing. And um, so that was the primer. Third year of med school comes around, I can do an elective. So why not radiology? Let's just see. And in my mind, I'm trying to balance, you know, the amazing ability of a surgeon's dexterity in their hands. I practiced suturing. I got really good at it. And, you know, technical skills were my thing. I liked working with my hands. And here it is, AI is the hot thing. Everyone's saying AI is going to take over radiology. I was one of the biggest people saying, why would you go into radiology? And then I actually spent some time in radiology and I was blown away. And I spoke to my, you know, directors at my program. I spoke to the different attendings. I really learned a lot about what it takes to be a radiologist and it was amazing. Um, and so I ended up applying to radiology and I haven't been more happy since. It's been fantastic. That's awesome. I'm not gonna lie, I'm like captivated just listening to you. Yeah, like you're, you're it was outstanding. I just wanna keep, you know, hear the rest of your life story right now. That's awesome, that's awesome. I was, you know, like, I always feel like you have like a, like a sermon, it's like voice, like, oh, really? yeah. And like, but you just like, even it's not even just like louder, it's just like you captivate um, us as the audience of two people, so. so. <laughs> It was very, very nice. I'm just like processing like the depth of and, and your journey. Um, it's, you know, I think like now doing, you know, four or five of these of our co-residents, like, you know, what's interesting for radiology is like, you don't like people don't find radiology on their first go around for the most part. Right. But like, you know, typically there's some kind of like strong clinical exposure that you're like, how do we come to this end stage? And it's like typically because there's a lot of like radiological workup prior to that, right? To really define like what's, you know, the pathology for that patient. And then ultimately from like the innovative standpoint, like, you know, where the new technology is coming from, right? right? And, you know, I'm sure like that probably um, kind of was like, it touched upon the interest that you had in like patent law itself and like, like the innovative like part of your experience. Yeah, and I think the other piece is, you know, when you go into medicine, you think about, you know, how are you going to help somebody, right? That was like the biggest piece of why I picked medicine over law is that, look, I'm going to impact this person. Like this is, this is someone's real life. And um, it was extremely important for me to, to be in that position. And when you think about radiology, you say, well, everything else is in person. What are you talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But radiology has that unique ability to become a master consultant, right? You master the ability to work with your colleagues to help others. And you're doing so at a scale that is much bigger than your primary care. You know, the best efficient clinic is seeing 40 patients, which is pushing it and it's extremely uncomfortable and the patient care kind of suffers for that. But in radiology, you're hitting volumes of 100 plus patients a day. I mean, that's so many people that you're able to help. And for me, that was just something I couldn't give up. No, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I mean, we were just talking about this before the interview. And, you know, I have a friend right now who's staying who's like a family medicine resident. And, you know, just like you said, like, it's just you're seeing the patient trying to give care at that time. And then, like, it's a limited 15, 30 minute visit. Right. And like for us, you know, because we're doing things a little bit asynchronously, like if it's a complex patient, you can spend the hour being like, what is actually going on and describe all the relevant findings. So it's, you know, providing the most amount of value for the clinician. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and you touched on the innovation piece and the intellectual property rights. I mean, 
it's it just goes together. Um, I was looking at you know what field produces a lot of innovation, and you look at, I mean, radiology in itself is like almost tech based at this point mm -hmm. with all the mm -hmm. physics. And so there's different avenues, I mean, just in the physics alone, right? It's a really complex topic, but if you understand it, then you can actually work on the machines. Mm -hmm. If that's not what you like and you want to work on the patient care side, you can work on different product design for catheters if you're an IR um, or even just the different biopsy tools. Um, and then all the way out to the AI that you can work to help make your life better and take care of patients more efficiently. Mm. Um, so there's just so many different avenues. And so for me, it just fit really well. Nice, nice. Um, kind of, you know, basing up, like following from that question, you know, why pen? Yeah, okay, that is a, that's a great question. I was blessed with the opportunity to, you know, as many of us, to go to a lot of different programs and and uh, I can't be more thankful for that, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, You're saying interviewing. In, exactly. Um, but for Penn, the thing that I noticed, especially with this caliber of a program, were a couple of things. One is they want to produce leaders in the field. And for me, that was unique. I didn't see that at every program. Um, it was almost like here, the baseline is you're going to be a fantastic radiologist. Okay, mm -hmm. how are you going to push it to the next step? But we're going to bring people like that around you. And I was like, wow, that's, I mean, I remember them saying that and I was like, that's different. Mm -hmm. I did not hear that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next thing that I saw that was amazing, right, kind of comes back to full circle. They have a business in radiology track. They had tracks in general. I didn't see that a lot of programs, healthcare and leadership, teach track, um, global work. Those are all different things where you can kind of expand on those ideas and they want you to. And in academic time, right, a lot of programs want you to do these things outside of just the day to day grind, but they don't really give you the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it gets done, but it never gets done to the level that you were wishing you could. But here they're giving you that time to actually make it happen. And then they supply the tools for you to actually do it in an environment with like-minded people to do yeah. that. And yeah. so uh, for me, it was just, it was just a no-brainer. Uh, and then the final piece, which is really personal, Philadelphia, you know, is, has been a crux of, kind of my family tree, hmm. at least on my dad's side. And it's kind of remarkable because, you know, growing up in Virginia, doing most of my training in the southeast part of the country, mm -hmm. my parents grew up in North and South Jersey, and my dad was in the military, and he did his ROTC training at Penn Relay oh, wow. Field. Mm -hmm. wow. So he ran that track. Yeah. Um, family members got their health care at Penn, wow. right? And so uh, you've got such a big tie to the area, and then people moved out, and now I'm coming back yeah. in. Yeah. And so it's just like, oh, my gosh. So it felt like home. Yeah. It felt like home. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, no, but, like, you know, what's interesting is, you know, you had said that, like, you were looking for a place that develops leaders, yeah. right? Was that, like, a when you were ranking programs, even prospectively, um, was that like a parameter you were kind of paying attention to when like programs were giving you a pitch? Yeah, I, you know, it wasn't something that I went into the interview season thinking mm -hmm. about, but it was always something in the back of my mind of trying to do, but not really know exactly how to get there. Gotcha. So then when you have a program just straight up say it, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and I'm like, whoa, like yeah. that's different, yeah. that's different. So what's funny is like I had a, a parameter that was like, there's got to be a better way, um, like as a quote, because like that was something that like I felt in medical school, like a lot of things are like we've been doing this for 40 years or like 100 years. And like, especially from a teaching standpoint, like that's just the way it is. Yeah. And like hearing like, you know, there's got to be a better way was like literally a, a parameter that I had. 
And like, you know, going on all these interviews, like it was like, oh, some of them, they kind of hit on it. Like maybe they have some research. And then like my pen interview, literally, I think like Mitch said word for word, like Mary said it word for word, right? It was just like, like people, like it was like so eerie to hear that, right? And like, you know, now being in this program for like six months, it's like, it's not just something that like they say at the interview. It's like, holy shit. Yeah. Like everyone's coming at the, like every month and be like, what can we do better? Right. Like exactly. they've already done a whole lot of stuff. Great. Right. Like all the perks, like you just described, like yeah. we were just talking about it yesterday and we're like, oh, we have this and this and this and this. Yeah. And like everyone who's like not at Penn radiology is like, are you guys really serious? Like, yeah. can it really be that good? But it's like, yeah, because they've been so thoughtful and then not only thoughtful, but taking the feedback from other people with the global vision of what they like the infrastructure that they want to provide so that we're successful in whatever capacity. Right. Cause it's not just, you want to be a, a leader, but if you want to do private practice, here's the scope for it. Right. Exactly. And like, whether it's like the business of radiology track or like hit bar, which is like used to be how to be an academic radiologist. Now it's more global of how to be an awesome radiologist. Like right. all the stuff that's like, it, it really keeps in mind of like, they'll try to do their best. And I just think it's inspiring. Yeah, and, and I agree, you know, our chair, you know, every time he's speaking, it's, I can see the wheels turning in his head and, and he's just thinking like, how do I push, how do I shape the future of where we're heading? Never. And and as if he's thinking like, we're literally the tip of the spear here. And so we shape and direct where the field goes. And if I don't keep thinking like that, someone else yep. who's not is going to start making those decisions. Yep. Um, and so that's where we're like, okay, that's awesome. Let's get on track. Yeah. Well, and I think like to your point about innovation, like innovation is a big part about radiology in general, but it's a huge part of pen radiology, right. right? Like the amount of like, whether it's like, I think the first MR came out of pen, right. right? And like just crazy things. And even like the IR world, like, you know, Stanley Bomb, like these guys are just like legendary folks in, in radiology and like they just trained here or like they practiced here and like, right. you know, we're, we're truly standing on like shoulders of giants and like we reap the benefits of it and like no one even brings it up on a day-to-day -day basis. But like, yeah. I remember being on like nuclear medicine and it's like, you start, you know, you start Googling your attendings for the day yeah. and you're like, you're the <laughs> arsenic editor for this and yeah. like, and, like all these like crazy things. Yeah, so. exactly. I mean, but it's every single yeah like subspecialty yeah. you're you google you're attending you're like oh okay. <laughs> like that's amazing well it's just like i was reading i was i'm like studying for neuro for where we start on the rotation tomorrow and like even like the forward i don't know if you guys have read the forward but like it's sort of like an attending from john Hopkins, and she like references when she was a medical student like her attending that like really inspired her and it's like the director of neuro right now right, right? and it's like that was like 25 years ago almost mm -hmm. and like like that you can just see like that passion just continued for so long. Yeah, it, it's truly remarkable. Dude, it's so good to learn like the similarities of what brought everyone to radiology yeah. and pen radiology in general. But before we got to pen radiology, we had to go through a preliminary year. Yeah. Now, interestingly, you uh -huh. chose to do a medicine prelim uh -huh. at University of North Carolina. Yeah. Now, was there a rationale behind the madness or was it just like, hey, I'm just going to take this uh, adventure and do it for a year? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and I, I try to spread this message to the new rising M4s that are going mm. to pick their next year if they're going to do radiology or, or any uh, transitional type year. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I interviewed at surgery, medicine, and TY years. And I interviewed at what I thought were tough programs and what I heard were more relaxed programs. And I did that because originally I was gonna do the surgery year um, so that I could, because I was planning on you know really going gung-ho into IR. Mm -hmm. But then I kind of gave it more thought and I said, well, what I really want out of my intern year is to be a confident and competent physician because that's important. That's what we are. And, and so that led me to, okay, these more relaxed I am years, am I gonna get what I need out of this for what I want? I know it's gonna be more chill, but 
at the end of the day, I want to feel confident and competent in what I'm doing. And so when I was interviewing, UNC was one of the only programs that I noticed that the residents felt so close together that the program was extremely strong. They knew the work was hard, but man, they had the best attitude. They had the best attitude on the Zoom night. They had just worked so late and they came on Zoom and they were having the fun banter between each other and making the best out of whatever the situation was. And so I was, I was drawn to it. I knew it was gonna be tough, um, but I, I knew if I was gonna do something tough, let's do it around people who are motivated. And, and so, man, they did not let me down. <laughs> <laughs> How many 24 hours? Uh, or did you guys have 24 hours? So here's the thing, UNC Internal Medicine is an absolute phenomenal program. You will be trained under the most, you know, you're gonna push the boundaries of your learning. You're going to be in positions where you feel uncomfortable, but they have the best support system. The program director is out of this world. She cares so much about the residents. If I were to do internal medicine, I would have stayed there. Mm. It was that good. Now, that being said, of course it was challenging, but the program director made sure that, that you weren't gonna get taken advantage of. So there were no 24 hours mm. wow. for my intern year. Um, if you did a week of nights, you got a week off. So uh, that's separate from your vacation? Or that is separate from your vacation. Wow. That's really good. You wow. get vacation and you get either New Year's or Christmas off the week. Mm -hmm separate from your vacation. Sounds like the Penn Radiology of Medicine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's really good. Awesome. It, it, that's it good. was a phenomenal program, but I will tell you, <laughs> on day one, scratch that, day before day one, I get a call after doing a little, you know, walk through the hospital, and you see the teams rounding and they're all bubbly and happy. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> it's your first day. We're so happy to have you, right? And they're like, don't worry. It'll be good. You know, we'll show you the ropes, all this stuff. So I'm thinking, coming from the med student perspective, oh, they'll slowly, you know, introduce patients up to a certain number. The max is 10 per ACGME rules, blah, blah, blah. And... I get a call at like 2.30 in the afternoon. I'm trying to decompress. Tomorrow's first day of intern year. Mm -hmm. And I get a call and I'm on nephrology service. And he's going patient by patient, yeah. six patients. I'm trying to write down everything he says. I don't really know how to take sign out because I don't even know what sign out really is. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm writing down this, trying to write the one liner, Googling, you know, getting yeah. on Epic, all this stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, okay, yes, okay, um, all right. And I was kind of mad because I was like, who is this guy and why is he calling? Like, why is he telling me all this? I'm trying to, I'll do it tomorrow. Like, right. I had no idea the concept. And so he calls back again at eight o'clock because it was their call day and they were admitting. And he's like, hey man, uh, sorry, I got four more news because he, he was the admitting intern that yeah. day. And so I wasn't nervous for the first day. Oh, but I was angry. Oh, I was so mad. I was like, it's my first day and I got 10 patients. I can't believe it. Like all this stuff. And the first day was, it was a trip. Oh my gosh. Everything from, oh, you should print out this patient list. Oh, you should print out this other patient list. Oh, you should take notes like this. Oh, you should do this. Yeah. Oh, this is how you should do this, this, right? Meanwhile, they're like, okay, round start at, I don't know, like 8.30, 9 a.m. And I get there, I'm you know super early, trying to pre, but then I'm, I've got all these different papers. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's, it's time to round, like first day, and like, okay, we're gonna go see our first patient. And I've got like notes on one paper and this paper, and it was just like, and the attending's so kind, and like, okay, yeah, good job, <laughs> you know. And of course, like everyone, you find your groove. The seniors were phenomenal. I kid you not. This 
the my senior, I thought he was like a fellow or the attending because he was so good. And he was like a rising third year. Wow. The guy was out of this world. He stayed. He worked 14 days in a row so that the first weekend, the interns didn't have to be by themselves. Wow. That's awesome. It's amazing. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. And so what I learned really quickly at UNC is what you want to be is you want to come out of there at the level as your senior. Mm -hmm. That should be your goal. For any intern, I think you should try to be at the level of your senior when you leave. They want you to stay mm -hmm. because you're going to be confident and competent at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And so that, for me, was why I thought UNC was a great program. So we should cut this part, send a trailer to UNC, them, tell them, hey, $200, you, <laughs> you get the full, and that's your recruitment pitch right there. And this guy's not even in I am. <laughs> He's diagnostic. Ask yeah. every single diagnostic radiology resident here. They're, they're trying to run away from medicine. <laughs> and your best pitch is going to be from a DR resident. <laughs> yeah. But no, that is such an amazing way to approach interning. And I feel like for a lot of us, um, DR or IR, mm -hmm. um, we sort of approach interning from the mindset of, it's just one year to get it over with, right? Yeah. You go on Discord, you go on Reddit, you look at all the... Applicants, you look at the current PGY1s, they're like they're basically counting down their days because you know we're less than six months left, yeah. right? Yeah. But I feel like your mindset is it's 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 unfortunately unique because mm -hmm. that's the exact mindset all of us should have. You know, let's make the best use of this year. Um, learn stuff clinically because at the end of the day, this will come around not just in radiology, but also in real life. Right, you could be the yeah. one person on the airplane, you're the one physician right. exactly. where your skills will be called upon, and you know it'll be those muscle memories that yeah. should kick in. No, but <laughs> you're right, and and I, and I think you know, man, there was just so many experiences that were you know that just like send you right back to the patient room. Like when I think about it, it like it sends you right yeah. back, and I mean even like my first weekend by myself. Uh, or, or as a solo intern, the weekend after the, the yeah. senior yeah. did that amazing job. Man, I come in, it's like 6 a.m. I'm like the only one there. Cause I got there pretty, I like to get there really early. And, uh, and so I'm pre-charting and all this stuff. And a nurse kind of comes around the corner huffing and puffing. <sighs> and she's got an EKG strip in her hand. And she's like, I think this patient is having a STEMI. And I'm like, n like no way. Like, no way, right? Like, this is, what, July yeah. 10th or something like that? You know what I mean? Like, first week mm -hmm. or whatever. First couple weeks. And so I'm looking at it, and I'm like, okay, ST elevations, like, this might be true. Okay, let me go see the patient, right? So I go in the room, and it was my patient, thank goodness. Like, I kind of knew the backstory of her. And... Um, you know, she she was um, she looked very pale, and and I was like, oh my gosh, like this might be real. And so immediately, what popped in your head was like online med ed, right? right yeah. Mona Bash, and so yeah, going yeah. through my I'm like, okay, M, or, you know, I don't think she needs that. Like, oh, like okay, and I kid you not, like as I was kind of thinking about that, it was like a saving grace, a cardiology fellow walks through the door. And I was like, how in the world did that happen, right? Because I didn't call a STEMI mm -hmm. alert. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I was going through like, what do I need to do to stabilize the patient right now and then get those things in place? But within minutes of me showing up, he showed up and he was a first year cardiology fellow right out of his medicine residency. Mm -hmm. And so we were both working through this case yeah. like, you know, we were like, okay, do we, do we need aspirin? Like, yeah. all this stuff. And he calls his attending. And long story short, the patient was, she had an above-the-knee amputation for, like, really bad invasive cancer of her lower leg. Wow. Mm -hmm. And she had just had that done. Um, and she was hemorrhaging into the stump. Mm -hmm. And so she was having, like, an ischemic infarct. Wow. Um, and so, you know, the training kicked in and those experiences stick with you. And so now, like in radiology, 
right? You hear a rapid response. I right. mean, the rapids we went to last year were, man, the people were like on death's door. And so you get comfortable, as comfortable as you can be with making those decisions on the fly. I mean, you've got like 10 plus people coming in the room looking at you like, what are you gonna do? Because the philosophy at UNC is the intern is the primary physician. Really? Well, and the senior is like the attending that supports the primary physician. Yeah. So like you do almost everything. Now they did run the majority of the rapids like as like the point person, but like, as you transition throughout the year, you start taking on more responsibilities. And, and so now, you know, you're in an outpatient radiology clinic right. and like the rapid is, Oh, a little bit of shortness of breath, and you're like, okay, like we're yeah. good, yeah. and it's not yeah. as stressful, or you know, you can quickly glean the uh, the kind of maximum levels of what can be, and I think that's where the confidence comes from. Yeah, right? yeah. Because if someone's short of breath, you know, off the top of your head, you're like, oh wait, do I just turn up the oxygen? Well, what do you do after that? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you have the experience of like, you put on a non-rebreather and then BiPAP and, and then you get the experience of, okay, now it's intubation, there's nothing else after that. Mm -hmm. You've seen the limits of what can be done. Yeah. And so when you see a patient who's kind of like satting in the mid 90s, right. like they're kind of short of breath, like you're more comfortable with what's going on. You're not like, oh my gosh, but they're still short of breath. Right, right. Um, and so that kind of, over the year, you know, by the end of the year, it's just like, all right, man, I'm ready to go. Like, let's do what needs to be done. And so yeah. uh, that was my intern experience. But no, dude, that, that's an amazing, amazing way of approaching sort of intern year, mm -hmm. um, trying to sort of maximize your education. I don't think a lot of us sort of think of it that way. Um, but it's, it's so refreshing to kind of hear from a resident, and not like an admin person, but from a recent resident, what a good and rigorous interneur experience can give you and the valuable skills you can take away from it, right? right? Um, kind of connecting that similarly to our training at Penn, you know, people who walk in through the 80s never like, oh, I get this little appendicitis going around. You know, it's always this post-op day 10 patient who was discharged three days ago. Their abdomen, their small ball is in the thoracic cavity and they have this something going on and you're like, okay, right. that's the patient walking into our ED, right? right? No matter where we go after this, it's gonna be like simpler or simpler cases or cases that are just as complex as right. this. And we will be comfortable dealing with this sort of situations exactly. when we get those initial CT scans, right? Exactly. Um, so kind of the similarity between the rigorous clinical experience you got as an intern to the rigorous clinical experience we will get in diagnostic radiology exactly. and interventional radiology as well at Penn. Exactly. Right? Um, moving kind of right along, right now you're at Penn Radiology, you have these amazing reasons to come to Penn, you had an amazing rigorous intern year. Do you have any sort of special interest now that we're like more than six months in? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think I, think I was, it was a little bit more clear before. I think now it's even a little bit more challenging. And I think in a good way, I, I haven't come across a subspecialty that I flat out don't like mm. so far. Um, I think that there would be good reasons to pick a number of different specialties. The ones that I'm leaning more towards would probably be more applicable to private practice. Uh, if, you know, and, and that's kind of what I'm leaning towards at this point. Mm -hmm. um, abdominal in imaging is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that I think are unique to it is the ability to become skilled in every modality, right? And you're flexing those muscles each day, right? right. Fluoro, plain film, ultrasound, CT, MR, biopsies. I mean, to be able to do that is a great skill to have. But that being said, neuro is extremely complex mm -hmm. and kind of focuses on the most complex things, CT and MR. And so the different you know, subspecialties all offer their unique position and stance in radiology. For me, I think it'll come down to, okay, what do I value the most and I think can help the most people? And so right now, I haven't fully experienced all the subspecialties. 
Um, and so once I do, I think I can make a better decision. Nice, nice. So you're kind of, you love like cross-sectional imaging, basically like CT and MR. Um, same here, dude. I feel like it's it just kind of it's more fun to kind of see the broader picture of whatever you're dealing with. CT head, you you can sort of make out the entire head. You know, soft tissues, brain, bone. Um, MR is even more fun because you see more structures and you have mm -hmm. more sequences that give you different information, right? Yeah. And you can cone in on a very specific diagnosis. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the knowledge, you know, we are missing right now because we are R1s and we haven't had the full breadth of MR experience yet. But talking to many, many of the attendings, um, I don't think anyone ever complains about it. I mean, they all have their own unique areas of interest, mm -hmm. but anyone, I don't think there's anyone who ever complained about CT or MR. They all right. sort of share this love for these modalities. Yeah. Um, so I'm right there with you, man. I am also a little bit, um, I'm leaning more towards neuro, mm -hmm. but again, it's like, I love CT body. Um, yeah. MR body, I think would be just as fun. Yeah. Um, I don't mind CT chest and I don't like counting the nodules, but CT chest in general, you know, it's, Definitely um, more fun than chest x-rays, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, what I try to do in each rota rotation is kind of look at, you know, what is providing the best value. And so for CVI, right, the ability to understand how the CT machine works and be able to run those coronary cases, those complex cases, that is the value. Um, in neuro... Everything is the value. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's so complex, and it's and it's really neat. Um, you have to be on your A game every single day. Um, part of me really likes that, kind of coming from that that mindset of like playing football. But I could also see how it leads to a lot of burnout. Yeah, and a lot of tendings kind of um, slow down or want to do something a little bit differently yeah. uh, or different in the future, just because of that level of having to be switched on um, day in and day out with the stroke calls and stuff like that. Definitely, definitely. So, you know, as far as, like, as you can see, like, you know, I remember talking to Corbin, like, the first week, like, during orientation, and we just, like, started talking about the same kind of stuff, and, like, the passion he exudes, like, just got me so, like, fired up and, and excited. Yeah. And, like, you know, from that, we were just talking about, like, our shared kind of interest and the business of healthcare at large, mm -hmm. um, and then specifically kind of exploring, like, the field of radiology because, like, now, you know, it's one thing to, like, read about stuff before you've started, right. but, like, now, like, six months in, kind of getting more clinical experience, like, talking to our attendings and getting a better idea of, like, what you're kind of heard about, mm -hmm. read about, and now seeing in practice, um, you know, I think, like, gives us, at least for me, like, a better picture of, like, what the actual state of business in radiology is. Um, and so like some of those topics, you know, that we've kind of talked about, and you can kind of take it from whatever direction you want to was like, you know, the difference between like professional and technical fees. Um, and then stuff like teleradiology, private equity yeah. and radiology. And then like, even like the geographical differences of how practices are set up, the right. payment models associated with those. Yeah. Like, I know it's just, there's so much more variation than like we're kind of exposed to. And like, you know, all of us have trained now on like the East Coast for the most part. And it's like, it's a very different world, I think, you know, if you just go a little bit to the West or anywhere else in the country. Yeah. And, and I think the thing to me that is, you know, interesting uh, about radiology is the flexibility. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to the healthcare part, uh, the business of radiology, you know, I think when we think about those different geographical regions, we get tied to an area. And with that newfound flexibility, you have to wonder what else you can do, right? Um, and for me personally, when I think about where I want to practice at the end of the day, because I've experienced like Virginia and North Carolina and now like Philadelphia, mm -hmm. I got to tell you guys, it gets better. Right. The suburbs are <laughs> lovely places. <laughs> it gets better. Okay. Um, and but, I've, you know, I've met, you know, co-residents that are like, I got to be near New York. I got to be in like, this, this small little piece of the northeast yeah. where traditionally physicians don't get compensated at the same rate. And that's not to say that I think that physicians 
primarily should be making money off the backs of the patients that they care for. But rather the value that they're providing to society isn't reflected the same in the Northeast as it is in other areas. Um, and so that's where I get kind of interested in saying, oh, well, let's think about the Midwest. Oh, well, let's think about the Southeast. You know, these people need help, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they really need help. Um, the amount of innovation that's coming out of this little corridor of the Northeast is phenomenal. But it also, they know, hey, I got the city. You want to be here, man. Mm -hmm. So I can control what's going on. Whereas down in the Southeast and in the Midwest, look, we've got sick patients that just need your help. Mm -hmm. And so we'll accommodate different things to help make sure that you're comfortable here. And so for me, it's like, okay, I've got to weigh and balance those two things um, as I kind of move forward. Yeah, yeah. I, like, you know, I think to your point, there was like an article I sent you at some point, which was like the medical underserved areas, like as defined by Medicare. And like, I think when you start like mapping that out to like the geographical differences, like it's kind of clear why, you know, there's from a, um, you know, say value or financial standpoint, it's like more lucrative in that way to practice in those areas because patients need them, need that service more because the like density per like physician per like population is significantly less. Right. And like, it, you know, it's just those kind of things of like, I think, not necessarily that like money should be the driver for your decisions, but if you at least understand why it like the differences that you're seeing are that way, you can then agree or disagree with that and then ultimately make your decision with the full information there. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think it's important like for people who might like watch this and are not in the medical community to understand that we're speaking from like the physician standpoint mm -hmm. and and kind of reflect upon the fact that, okay, the years of training and the years of um, sacrifice that you give, you know, all the missed family vacations, all the different things, and not to say that you deserve anything, but rather that you just wanted to reflect the work that you put in um, and the value that you're bringing to the table. I think like, you know, up in the Northeast are in more densely populated areas, right? Healthcare becomes a commodity um, where, you know, you patients have almost have their choice of physicians, right? Their choice of hospitals that they want to go into. My dad works in West Virginia, you know, very, very rural areas. Um, there, people actually respect and look up to physicians and they actually heed their advice. You know, whereas, you know, sometimes I feel that being in bigger cities, you almost feel like, you're chasing numbers, right? Oh, you gotta meet X number of RVUs, exactly. not, hey, we have this panel of patients, you know, who are our regular folks, you know, who are from the surrounding areas. Let's do our best to kind of take care of them. Um, and because they don't have a lot of, you know, other hospitals or a lot of other options per se, you don't have to chase those numbers because these are the people who always come to this small community hospital, right? For my dad, you know, he sees the same patients. He's a pulmonologist, so he sees the same group of patients. And they, he has a, this great bonding with all of his patients to the point that he now he doesn't want to move from West Virginia. And right. we were like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> He'd rather visit us, you know, every two weeks or so, take that 550-mile journey. Mm -hmm. That's because, you know, he had to redo his residency and fellowship in New York City. Absolutely hated it. You know, it's mm. it's a... Uh, in Brooklyn, it's basically an IMG mill. You're the you're a warm body to write notes. He didn't get enough procedural experience, and the way things were run was purely sort of based on numbers. We gotta hit X R views. We you gotta hit this many hours. How do we get all of this done with the fewest staff possible? Right. right. Your training as a resident or a fellow is not our priority here. If you don't like it, you can quit will replace you just as quickly. Exactly. A lot of these programs are not even in the match. That match argument doesn't even exist. They're pre-match wow. programs, right? That's amazing. Um, That's crazy. And it's purely because, you know, they just have more people there and they know they have the population to kind of lock these residents in and they have no other options. Right. So again, it's a very different mindset for both administrators, patients, and physicians in more of these rural areas where, you know, People say they're quote-unquote backwards, but sometimes 
what that also means is they're still stuck in the good old days of medicine where it's not about chasing our views and numbers, it's about taking care of the patient to the best of your abilities. And that permeates across all the specialties, not just you know, patient-facing specialties, but in radiology and surgery as well. And, and I think that's like extremely important, right? Because in medicine, it almost seems like you can kind of go two different directions if you're trying to look at the uh, kind of the silver lining, right? Right. In the Northeast, or even in like, you know, the California area, you know, it's gonna, you might look more at numbers, but the innovation that you can do mm -hmm. might be a little bit easier to attain. And so if you look at it in that respect, you can provide this new way of helping people through the innovation that you produce. In the Southeast or in the Midwest, you've got that amazing ability to connect with your patients, connect with the physicians that you worked with together for 20 years. Um, and you know, I think it is kind of a shame that you know, there are programs out there where they treat their staff the way they do, where they don't look at, you know, they look at medicine purely as a business mm -hmm. and not as what we all kind of signed up for when we were coming in, that white right. coat ceremony, yeah. mm -hmm. when this is about compassionate care, about patients, yeah. that's the driver. Yeah. That should always remain like the backbone of why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. And so for me, that's why you know, I can really see the appeal for going kind of more in those underserved areas. Yeah. I think, you know, like you said, that the businessification of healthcare, right? Like from a philosophical standpoint, like once RVUs have come in play and everything, like it's one thing to be like, here are the things that have RVUs, but now it's like, well, what about the things that don't have RVUs, right? And like, you know, there's always, even within radiology or outside of it, like certain things, that like it's never going to get compensated. But does that mean it shouldn't be done? I don't think so, right? Okay. And like, but like those, whether it's those conversations or like the overall mindset of, of like physicians at the end of the day, like I don't think it's, it's talked about. And like when you have, say, administrators and people who are just looking at the spreadsheet and like making decisions solely based off of that, I think that's that like, you know, unfortunately, like the, the worst part of capitalism of uh, and like that kind of being what and like what like there's that phrase, right? Like whatever gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what RVUs have done. Right. right. Um, <laughs> and it, it's just like I got, I've like like throughout my training, it's like, you know what? Like you got to know all that stuff. But at the end of the day, like those are just numbers. Like, what are you going to do when you see that person and like, you're talking to them and like whatever care that you want to provide to them. Right. right. And like, just like you said, like keeping, keeping the patient in mind and that compassionate care. And I think like the more we can keep that in our, like ourselves, like to your point of where, like whatever practice we grow, even within radiology or outside, like I think more of our colleagues would appreciate that platform being there. And I, for me, that's why this kind of, this thing all kind of goes full, full circle of why I picked Penn, and it's the leadership piece, right? And so if I have that innate feeling and I meet like-minded people who want to continue to push the compassionate care for patients in medicine at a program where they promote you to be the leadership in medicine, you can maintain that or bring that to an area that has lost that focus. That's an excellent point. I think, you know, let's expand upon that a little bit more, right? You know, in terms of creating a radiology business in your mind, mm -hmm. right? What do you think? And let's say you're trying to bring it to an underserved area mm -hmm. in the Midwest, right? Mm -hmm. In your mind, what do you think are the most essential components that they need? Um, and we, will, we can kind of expand upon each piece. Um, so I guess, you know, the way I would break it down first and foremost is at the base of whatever business that you're gonna run, it's gotta be patient focused. Mm -hmm. um, we are physicians. If this is a physician run business, that has to be our angle mm -hmm. from the get go and maintain throughout. Because there's always someone else who doesn't have our training, who doesn't come at the business from this, standpoint of I want to improve someone else's life mm -hmm. 
they want to just make money. Right. And so that's not necessarily how I would approach it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you want to be compensated <clears throat> for the work that you're doing. But at the heart of it is I'm trying to make a difference. Right. And that's what I care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so if I were to bring that to like a Midwest area, yeah, I think what you have to focus on is bringing value. Of course.